Well, good morning. Hope everybody uh, had a good week and is enduring the heat okay, because um, that is an issue, isn't it? <laughs> but um, a couple updates for you. Um, uh, Chris and Julie, Chris has the, I'm, what I'm not allowed to say on YouTube, the, the Charlie Oscar Victor thing. So uh, yeah, keep him in your prayer. Nancy uh, has begun her journey to Colorado. However, um, she said though they didn't show any infections, I guess, on, the, on, on what they took. They do have her on uh, high dosage of antibiotics. She has found a doctor and a specialist in Colorado to be able to treat her. So they're able to do their journey and they're on their drive right now. She is in a lot of pain, she said. So uh, keep her in prayer for that. I don't have an update on Jerry. I have texted him uh, this morning and I haven't heard anything back from uh, from him and unfortunately uh, Amy is doing worse so uh, Clinton Amy please keep them in your their prayers I think she's moving into uh, an assisted uh, living portion of, of that facility so um, and that's an autoimmune issue that she has so uh, keep her in prayer for that so we have a lot uh, Bill of course still deals with his wife who is in um, is in a care facility, we'll say, and uh, dealing with, uh, I guess, Alzheimer's. It's okay for me to say that, so um, because that's a that's a big deal too, you know. And so he he comes every week faithfully, and uh, and and during the week he's struggling with dealing with communication and care for his wife. So uh, thank you, Bill, for being so faithful to be here, and we're, she's constantly in our prayers. So. Um, that's something I, I didn't mean to be over the last few weeks neglect her it's just all this stuff comes up but it's definitely um, definitely worth keeping in your prayers boy you know the world is uh, is not fair is it you know and and so it's very evident as we as our small community here in this uh, in this Sunday school class um, see and still recognize that illnesses and pain and yet what was supposed to happen today was Mike was supposed to speak but then he had three root canals to have done and so he he said he'll, he'd like to do it after he's done with that so Mike was going to talk uh, about his recovery from cancer and uh, Steve had said that he has also had a similar experience where he's been the same thing they can't find any cancer correct in your bone marrow or anything and if you I mean it's been you've been so same Pray. So I still am so excited to hear Mike because he's had a long battle with that. I think it was a brain tumor many years ago, and then this, and then, and that was a 13-month chemo period, and then, then, then the Charlie Oscar Victor thing came around, and uh, all of that was all going on, you know. And so I can't wait to hear his story. So I'm still very excited about that, and hopefully sometime in July he'll feel well enough to be able to do that, and we'll we'll fit him in when when he feels like he's ready. But he was all excited to do it. He was very upset last week when he told me oh I've got this pain and I have to get these root canals done um, so he'll be doing that but uh, before we get I guess any further let's uh, open up with a uh, word of prayer lots of people to pray for uh, lots of uh, praises I think to give the Lord for for our ability to come and open the word and study it I mean that's just a marvelous thing so let's pray dear Lord thank you for your truth thank you for your will being done we don't always understand it. We don't understand the pains and the sufferings and the illness, but we know that's part of the disease. And the disease was Adam and Eve and the fall of man. And so we know that death awaits us all, unfortunately, and yet you offer eternal life. You offer a riding of the ship, a placing back into, uh, into eternity with the creator God. And so, Lord, we are so thankful that you sent your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die and rise again, that he would be the first fruits that we have a place to follow. So no matter what, we have praise. We have praise, even the hardships that we endure on this earth. We know ultimately, if you are saved, we know where you're going. If you're not saved, it's easy. He, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so we know that you are the door, you are the way. It's simple faith in you equals that and so equals that uh internal salvation and so 
Lord, with all the people that I already mentioned, Lord, we just place them in your very capable hands. For, for your will to be done in their lives, if it be healing, please heal them completely in such a way. Let it be a testimony to others that they might come to know who Jesus is. For all of this serves your will. And so we ask for a understanding. We ask for wisdom and understanding in each of these situations. As we open up your word today and look at Ezekiel and look at a, a, a last day's alert, uh, look around our, our nation and uh, in this particular one, I ask that uh, your word rise to the surface, that your Holy Spirit does the teaching, that as always, my words step out of the way, and your words are the ones that ring true to our heart and to our mind, and that we might be able to take those words and use them in our daily lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at uh, today, um, let me do that. Um, at our uh, last day's alert to begin with, the first thing, uh, well, the title is, is going to be the second story. It's biblical worldview, and some of you who have been paying attention probably know maybe what I'm going to talk about. But either way, before I do that, I just wanted to remind people of what the rainbow really means. Um, but uh, before I read that verse real quick, because uh, there was a... Uh, this week, there was a Los Angeles Dodger Tampa Bay uh, baseball game, and five of the Tampa Bay players chose not to wear a particular patch that celebrated that particular day of, uh, of celebration that they were having at that stadium. And of course, then all the people came out and said, wow, it wasn't until later on that a relief pitcher came out, and then another one came out, and, uh, and they weren't wearing their patch, right? So uh, the... The article here that I have is from the New York Times. It's by Tyler uh, Kepner, and it was written on the 6th of, uh, of June, right after it happened. And it, it said Tampa Bay then listed the five players, full names of who they were and why they, and one person spoke for them. His name was uh, Jason Adam. And this is what he said. A lot of it comes down to faith, to uh, like a faith-based decision, he said. So it's a hard decision. Uh, because ultimately, we all said that we want, uh, what we want is them to know that all are welcome and loved here. Says, but, um, yeah, but when we put it on our bodies, I think a lot of guys decided that it's just a lifestyle that, that maybe not that they look down on anybody or think differently. It's just that maybe we don't want to in uh, to encourage it if we believe Jesus who encouraged uh, us to live a lifestyle that would abstain from that behavior. Uh, Adam added that we love these men and women, we care about them, and we want them to feel safe and welcome here. So he, there was nothing wrong to me in that statement that he was saying about, about that, but this particular author in the article goes on to say a couple things which are kind of interesting. As a low payroll team that challenges convention, the Rays prioritize clubhouse harmony without buy-in from players. Their unorthodox on-field strategies might not work. The organization wanted to share its values uh, with its uniform, Silverman said, but it would not force the players to comply if they were uncomfortable. So, one, I thought it was interesting that the excuse was that they were a low, that they didn't have the salary to be able to pay, so therefore these are the, the lesser guys of the league, I guess, because they're not getting the higher pay because we get what we can get, and so this is all we can afford is some of these. I mean, that's just, to me, was weird. Um, but he also said, the, the, the gentleman then, that was the team representative. Now the, the author of this article said, the Rays undercut the message of inclusion they were trying to send. So he thinks that that was a real blast, and he goes on to give past information. I want to dwell on it because we have another last day's alert, but it's interesting. It's an article out of the New York Times called Baseball's Attempt at Inclusion Proves That There's More Work to Do. So that was entitled, and, and, and so if you're not all in, remember we talked about intersectionality some years ago. Uh, intersectionality is if you don't believe every single part of every diversion from from normalcy then you are out so you could be a gay person that doesn't believe in abortion you're out 
You could be a person that's in, uh, into abortion that doesn't believe in trans, uh, transsexuality, you're out. You're, you know what I mean? Everything, you're out. You've got to be believing all of it or nothing, and that's why they say more work to do, more work to do. I have been curious to go back and look at the Newsweek, I think it was either Newsweek or Time article that we did several years ago about how Hollywood was going to start pushing transgenderism into the, and it, it wasn't that long ago, and it was still a little bit shocking. Really, you're going to start putting that in all the movies? From there to here, very short period of time. I don't know how many years. i got to go back and find that article and when we did that last day's alert but I said watch out well sure enough watch out look where we are now if you're not then you're really we're gonna name you and we're going to shame you because you're not all in on this particular thing and yet he said it's not about love it's just that I'm not gonna wear that on my body because I'm a Christian I don't think that's what Christ would have me do that was his point and yet and he said I still I support you I mean I love you there's not about that and yet that was not good enough for the person who wrote that article in the New York Times. Surprise, surprise. So just a reminder, because now we have a whole month dedicated to the rainbow. Let's see what the rainbow means. This is what God said. After he created the rainbow, right? The first rain and the flood. And after that, you know, Adam and, not Adam, excuse me. Noah is finally back with his family. And this is what he says on the earth. And he says, I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of a covenant between me and the earth. This is a God promise. Remember, God promises are, are eternal. This is his promise. He didn't require man to do anything to make this promise. This is God's promise between him and the earth and all of creation that lives on the earth, those animals that came on the ark, so on and so forth. It says, it shall be that when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I, God, has established between me, God, and all flesh that is on the earth. That's pretty nice. I like looking at a rainbow and remembering that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, isn't that interesting that he mentions the animals, all flesh? So he, you know, I, this is a, no, this is a very, it, no, no, it is. And it's, it's a serious, it's an interesting thing because here is a covenant. This is before the promises to, to uh, Abraham, right? So this is, this is after his initial judgment on this uh, no consequence world, really, basically, where man just became very, very evil. Only one family, 120 years to build a boat. And every and so you know he was a faithful servant of the Lord. Probably, I imagine telling others, God's going to send rain, and they're laughing at him, right? Because of the way you're living, because you're not honoring him, because you're not recognizing him. And yet he does, he spares the animals. I have a very interesting thought, because there will be a new heaven and a new earth, right? So we know ultimately we have that. Is God going to populate it with new animals, or is he going to bring back animals that actually live? I know they don't have a spirit, but they have a soul. It's kind of interesting to me. There seems to be, I think the animals have sometimes a better understanding of who God is than many humans do, i.e., let's look at the donkey who spoke, right? So, so we, have, we have that situation where, is that? I've always asked this question, did the donkey speak of what it saw, observed, and, and felt in its life, or was God just giving it words? Because he said, I've been faithful to you. If I would have moved forward, that angel would have destroyed you. You don't see him, but I see him. So that's what the donkey said. So it's really interesting to me. It says that all the earth, I mean, it says the, the, the leaves, the trees cry out. I believe when God, when Jesus said that, that this, your appointed day, the day of Palm Sunday that he came down, if I told them to be quiet, the rocks would cry out. I think literally they would have cried out. So there's something more about creation than I think we fully get. We always just think human, 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 right? Certainly, Jesus Christ did not die for the animals. He died for us. And the animals are part of our existence. But I don't know what the eternal purpose of those animals are. But here we see that the promise is to 
all his creation, if you will, right? That he will not flood the earth. So because I think the animals live on the earth as man lives on the earth, the promise is it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? The promise is equal, of course, because he's not going to kill them all. He had to gather them, right? too as well. So he separated and saved a group of them to continue his original creation on earth without the evil. Yeah, Elaine. It was. I know, isn't that interesting? All of them. No, all of them, except for the ones he started over with. I know it's it's so probably because I mean, it's possible. I mean, there's a lot of thought about that flood. Um, Genesis chapter uh, six, as it deals with humanity and possibly the sons of God, it says it's it's a whole study. But, you know, angels, Nephilim, all that stuff. Was there a whole lot of other evil going on? Bestiality? Who knows what was going on during that time? Uh, we don't know. But maybe God was just saying, I, I'm starting fresh. All of that, all of that that was was just repulsive to me, I'm removing and I'm going to start over with this. I'm going to take, if you will, uninjured, un, un, um, uh, defiled creatures of all of my creation and start over with them. You see what I'm saying? It's a, it's a weird thing. No, we're not. Just what man did. Right. right. But uh, yeah, I know. But what is it? I don't know. Yeah, we're not. We only know what man did. And, and we know that whatever it's, it's. And remember, his reference to the last days is to look at the days of Noah and to look at the days of Lot in the town of that. Only Lot was saved. Only Noah and his family was saved. Right. And Lot and his wife. Well, until she turned around and his two daughters. Right. So that's all that that's all. So they had zero fruit, which is kind of interesting to me. Why would they have zero fruit, especially when Noah's grandfather was alive at the same time as Adam and Eve? I, I don't get that at all. Why wouldn't you go to the source and say, Adam, Eve, tell me about the garden. Tell me about you walking. It, tell me about this with God. Tell me about that initial creation. Tell me about naming the animals. Why wouldn't you do that? Evidently, people weren't doing that and didn't care because it, there was no fruit of any of that except for Noah. So it, it's astonishing to me, and yet God makes this covenant, and it kind of shows the grace of God again. Even though we know he's going to do it by fire next time, he's not going to do it by water, he's going to do it by fire. So he has his judgment way, but he said, okay, I'm not going to do it this way anymore. This is, this is to remind you, but we don't look at the rainbow and remember the flood, hardly. We said beautiful rainbow, but I, I mean, Christians, hopefully we do, but often we don't. We're supposed to. Right. It's another covenant thing. And so it's just like all the covenants that Abraham had, you know, given to him and the Jews, they should be looking back at those covenants and saying, okay, God's promise. So what, what I want to learn more about this God. And if, if they did, then they would, uh, then they would come around, I think, to Christ. Very, very interesting thing. I don't want to get too deep into it because it does take us off subject. But uh, I just saw an interview with Naomi Wolf on a, um, might have been a Jewish uh, uh, interviewer. And uh, she is evidently Jewish, but was a, has been an atheist. When this whole Charlie Oscar Victor thing came around, she said, when you want to make a passport, a universal passport that shows your health issues, she says, I'm in the tech industry. She said, it is nothing to add finance to that, to add um, anything I want carbon credit scores, whatever it is that I want to add, it's nothing. We just turn a switch and they're, now they're monitoring that. So it's, it's beyond just knowing whether you have a certain jab. It's beyond that. It becomes everything, all your health records, all your financials, all your, it becomes all that. And so she was like preaching that at the beginning, early on. So I hadn't seen her in an interview in a, in a little while. And, and she has this interview and she said, you know, What's going on? She goes, I, I've realized, she goes, this can't be just a human thing. She goes, this is spiritual. She said, I now am seeking God. She said, for, so for the, here's a Jewish woman who didn't believe in God that says this has to be 
This is a battle between darkness and light. This is a spiritual battle. There has to be a creator. Isn't that amazing? She's come around to a creator point of view from that because of the current situation, what's going on in the world. So we get, wow, someone's, and I always think the veil's starting to be lifted, right? So the, the, the Jew, on the Jewish people. But in this particular case, she saw the truth in one area and God is starting to reveal himself to her. Man, I pray for her. Pray that she comes to also recognize Jesus Christ as the way out. You know, I mean, that's, that's the way, that's the only way, right? And so um, very interesting, though, as we see all this happening and starting, people starting to go back and say, hold it, hold it. This, everything that's going on, the stuff we talk about every week is a, is a spiritual, there is a spirit behind it because it's happening universally. The World Economic Forum, the WHO, the, you know, all of these different groups that are, are working, they're all working for this one world government. I just uh, read an article about Saudi Arabia and, and talking about the new uh, um, bin Sa Mohammed bin, ha bin Sa the, the Mohammed bin Sal uh, anyway, the prince, the anointed prince from the current king who will be the next king, most likely he's the favored son of all the sons and and, but he's had some conferences, and they're talking about within five years building this, this mecca of, of commerce and everything in the Middle East. Interesting. Babylon, anybody? And he thinks it can be done within five years. That's something, too. I think it's called, oh, no, Novum? No. Something like that. I, I, I have to look it up. I don't have the article in front of me. But it's very interesting, as you see, from all aspects of the world, they're all looking towards this new world, new world order, one world type government in which somebody is going to rise to the top of that, and we know who that is. Here's the, here's the real one. I only threw that one in just because it's, it's the month that it is, and I always like to remind people of, of what God sees in the rainbow. When he looks down, he sees this promise. Isn't that wonderful? But here we have... So for all that God has said, we have this study that came out of, um, that came, well, it was Barna, who is out of uh, Arizona Christian, well, I'll read it, it's in the article. The study finds that 37% of uh, pastors have biblical worldview, spiritual awakening needed in our pulpits, is what this particular article by uh, um, uh, Christian Post uh, contributor, well, he's a contributor, so the Christian Post. This was back in May, but it's been out there, and I've seen it coming around. This is the report. You can look it up online and actually read the actual report and some of the questions that are in it. But it says a new uh, study from the uh, Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University has found that just 37% of Christian pastors in the United States have a biblical worldview, demonstrating that spiritual awakening is needed just as desperate in our pulpits as uh, in the pews, according to the pollster. It says, the nationwide study of about a thousand Christian pastors, so they tried to go across denominations, so they looked everywhere. Uh, if you read the whole study, you can see what they tried to do. Um, found that just slightly more than a third, 37% of U.S. pastors hold a biblical worldview. The majority, 62%, possess a hybrid worldview known as uh, a sync uh, syncretism, right? So here's what that means. It says the, be the blending of ideas and applications from a variety of holistic worldviews into a unique but inconsistent combination that represents their personal preferences. More than six out of 10 pastors, 62%, have a predominantly uh, centri centristic uh, worldview. So they are combining whatever they think or feel with that. Well, that kind of leads into this um, this last day's church, doesn't it? Where we're talking, uh, well, we can go to Revelation and, and look at the churches there. But here's what it claims, okay, versus reality. Among the 51% of adults who claim to have a world, so they've taken, these are just the ones who say, so only 51% say I have a biblical worldview. And of those 51% that say it, it says there are massive inconsistencies between what they believe and what the Bible teaches. Let's go through the questions real quick and then I'll show you their answers. It is, uh, is, is it very important for your religious faith to influence every dimension of your life? So we'll get, yeah, okay, good. I'm glad you guys are along with me. Uh, are human beings, uh, no, hu are human beings, I shouldn't be are, it was, I had to rephrase them because, uh, are born 
with a sinful nature and can only be saved from the consequences of sin by Jesus Christ. We would agree with that. Um, when you die, uh, you will go to heaven only because you have confessed your sins and have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Okay? Um, you, uh, your most likely source of a moral guidance in any given situation would be the Bible. I would expect all pastors to say, absolutely. We'll see what there is. Um, reincarnation uh, as a possibility after you die. Hmm, that'll be an interesting one. Let's see what they have to say there. Um, and has the uh, personal accumulation of your uh, money and other forms of wealth has been entrusted to you by God to manage for his purposes. I agree, absolutely. So I, I'm pretty good with that. Hopefully most of you are all right with that. Here's what the first one is. Important for your religious faith to influence. 31%, 41% say it's very important. 46% do say it's important. This is of the 51% who claim they have a, uh, so we're already only looking at the ones who say they have a biblical worldview. The other ones don't. Yeah, how about this? Uh, human beings being born uh, with a sinful nature, right? Required Jesus Christ, just 33% believe that. Uh, when you die, uh, you go to heaven only because of your confession of Jesus Christ, your Savior. 47%, all right, that's a little bit better, but still, that's 47% of the 51%. Um, your most likely source of moral guidance for any given situation, less than half, 49% say that that's the reference. Reincarnation possibility, get this, same, 49% say that's a possibility. What, do they know their Bibles? Is that not amazing? Yeah, has the personal accumulation of money and other forms of wealth been entrusted to you, right, by God to manage for his purposes? 26%. No, my money is mine? No, it's God's. It's hard to preach on tithing when you say, when you say that. Well, you want it from this way, but then you're not going to do the same. I don't know what it is. That's just crazy. How about this? Okay, so this is what the study showed. Ready? 41% of senior pastors have a biblical worldview. So a little better than our 37%, right? Senior pastors. How about, how about this? 28% of associate pastors have a biblical worldview. Wow. How about this? 13% of teaching pastors have a biblical worldview. Now, I'm not a pastor here, but I would consider myself a teaching pastor if I were a pastor here, right? So, um, you know, if I was on staff or whatever, or either way, 13% and, and the congregation is learning from some of the, I mean, that's supposed to be the guy, the people that are really into the word, not just the people maybe giving a particular topical sermon, but the people that are teaching the word. 13%? That's crazy, right? How about this? 12% of, of children's and youth pastors have a biblical worldview. Please, if you have young children in your uh, Sunday schools across the nation, please ask them what they're learning. And you have to know the Bible well enough to be able to correct it if it's wrong. You need to. It's the same thing with your schooling at your regular school. They're in there most of the week. Sunday school, they get maybe an hour at the most. During the week, they're getting all day, five days a week. Ask them what they're learning and make sure that it's, it fits your biblical worldview if, that's, if you're a believer in Christ. That seems important to me because that's in the church. How about this? The lowest level of biblical worldview among exec, is, is, was among executive pastors with only 4%, 4% of them holding consistent biblical beliefs and behaviors. A lot of times the executive pastors aren't necessarily doing a lot of teaching. They're there to help with administration, and therefore maybe they're, I don't know, not even reading their word, evidently. So that was shocking to me, right? I, I'm like, wow, you know? So uh, here's another study that revealed by the Barna group, same group, because it is Barna, the George Barna, I think is his name, who's the head of that Christian university here in Arizona who's been doing the polling. But it says, and you've heard of Barna polls, I'm sure, before. Uh, Anyway, showed last uh, month showed that more pastors now say they considered quitting their jobs compared to a year ago, driven to despair by stress, loneliness, political uh, divisions, and other worries like their church being in decline. What the about God's will? I know. What about God's that's, will? That's not a Evidently not. Yeah, is it? Uh, it's shocking to me. This was like this really irked me, and you'll you'll know why in a minute, but the, the share uh, of pastors who have seriously considered quitting being in full-time ministry within the last year increased from 29% in 2021 to 42% in March of this year. 
said, I, I'm done with it. I'm walking away from it. I'm not that. All that. Yeah, well, it, what it does is, and, and, and the study's worth looking at, so I, I'll go uh, back real quick. The uh, study right here is, um, hang on, let me do it this way. It'll be faster, sorry. Um, the study right here, if you look it up, it tells you the group, so you know that they're talking to, uh, they're talking to, um, what do they call it? Uh, oh, some of the, some of the woke, more woke, you know, type churches. How uh, cornerstone fit into those numbers? Well, you know, it, th that's a good question. I would certainly love to pull all the pastors with the same questions that they asked there. Uh, and that w I just took a handful of them. They asked fifty something questions, but those are the ones that were uh, headlined in this uh, particular. Uh, it's called uh, uh, um, American Worldview Inventory 2022, release number five. And you can look that up and read the entire thing. And it tells you, it tells you that it's a broad based that out of, oh, and I should have printed it. I can pull it up, but, um, and I didn't print that article and I meant to, because it does tell you out of the non-denominational Christian churches, which is what we consider ourselves to be, the numbers are better. They are definitely better in there, and they're quite a bit better. But still, overall, this is across the nation on a world, on a, on a swath. Is this so. Protestant-based or all-faith? Uh, I believe it was Protestant-based. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. Included, you can see the numbers. No, 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 no. It's Protestant-based. Uh, let me tell you, I just watched a, um, uh, let's see. We are right here, right? I just watched a video because of the month that we're in. Um, it was hard to watch. I could not watch it all. I'm sorry, but a transgender, I don't know if he was a pastor or just speaker for them, was speaking on uh, Noah. And I, I don't know how you get there. I just, it's just so hard. And, you know, unfortunately, this is, this is you know, some of the, some of the, the things. One is this. Um, James says, my brethren, let not, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. I, I one, it, it's, I am zealous about the word of God. And sometimes that causes me to be confrontational. I was a little bit that way with Elaine uh, a couple weeks ago. And I didn't mean to be at all. But it, it's just because, and she was right. It just, I didn't feel it fit that that particular verse, but she was right in that. And that's true. We learn all this stuff and it's hard, but I, I, I'm very, very adamant. And the one thing I can promise you is, and if I'm wrong, I'll come back. I'll find the word scripture. Please show me scripture to show me because I'm trying to use scripture to interpret scripture. I'm, I think it is very, very, very important that we get it right because it's, it's our God. It's the one that we will bow down to. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess, right? Our, our Lord Jesus. And, and so, in that, I want to be, I don't want to stand before him and him go, man, you were teaching wrong. You were teaching that all this was okay. Read Romans chapter 1. Do you still feel the same way? No, that's what it says. It's hard. It sends people leaving the church, but I can't be woke. I have to be true to the scripture. I have to be. And so I apologize sometimes when I come across and go, no, I don't think that's right. It doesn't fit right here. I'm, I'm so... and. To a fault. And Mary kind of reminds me sometimes, my wife, saying, you need to be softer there. You need to, you know, and it's true. I do. I do. So I apologize for when I come across too absolute. But the word is absolute. It's the truth is absolute. And, and it's that, that that makes us free. And so in that particular case, I want to be right on. And I know this is I, James 3.1. I'm sorry. This is what the Lord's led me to do, and I'm going to be held responsible for everything I teach or say. So I, I, I'm going to do my study, I'm going to, and sometimes I'm going to get it wrong, or I'll just misspeak. I'll missay a word. I, sometime I, somebody said, did you say Daniel and not David? And I said, oh, maybe I did, you know, or whatever, you know. But, it's, but I'm trying. I really, really want to make sure that anything that I have prepared from my notes is accurate to, to, so that you can take it and study it right? Search the scriptures daily to find out whether or not these things are so. That's what the Bereans did to make sure and say, yep, yeah, okay, I have a good, solid, sound structure to continue to build my faith. It's not me. It's God that's going to give you that faith and that understanding. He's the teacher anyway. Yeah, Steve. Stricter judgment, yes, but look at the other side. You're going to receive rewards in heaven for your service. Perhaps. So it's worth it. Perhaps. Oh, it's, it's absolutely worth it. it. Oh, I know it's worth it. That's, that. well, no, thank you. 
Well, no, 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 thank you for that. That's very, very kind. And I always think it's not even going to be this that I get my reward for. They'll be just for being kind to someone or giving them a glass of water or whatever. But this is this I'm obligated to do. Yeah, all of us. Yeah. So here's the other verse that I have uh, for us. And this one is from Timothy because we just went through Timothy. But Timothy, First uh, Timothy, chapter four, verse one says, now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, this is the end of the church age, uh, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And so this is what we're seeing when I say I found a person uh, that was speaking from a pulpit that was speaking with a completely uh, non-biblical lifestyle and encouraging others that that was okay, be accepting. And yes, we do. We love you. But, but I think Jesus has some work to do in you before you step up in front of others and teach them something that isn't biblically correct. So, you know, it's one of those things, but it's the era in which we live. So, um, yeah. I would, I would agree with that survey uh, 100%, just anecdotally. Yes. In my experience over the past X number of years and being in multiple churches, um, seeing decisions that were made that were not based out of preaching the word, but instead of shaping the word so that it becomes more palatable to man to increase numbers and numerically within a church with the, with the thought being that we get to speak to and influence more people. However, to, to do that, there's a reduction in what the word actually says. Yeah. If you were to go into these same churches and then ask them a simple question, what is the good news? What is the gospel? And people would tell you that God is love that God cares about man, that God this. That's not the gospel, that's not the good news. Mm. And if we can't answer that question, then, I mean, we are born into sin. And if you do not repent, if you do not come to Christ, then are you a Christian no matter where you sit on a Sunday morning? The answer to that's very clear. We, we don't preach that. There's little conviction that I see left in the pulpit that truly cares for the state of man. And if that's the case in the pulpit, then when we go across the whole of segment of humanity that we live in right now, let's say in the United States, is it surprising that we're in moral decay? Is it surprising that the things 10, 20 years would have been seen as heretical and contrary to who we are as a people are now in the forefront? No. To me, I would, I would absolutely see that. If that's supposed to be our, our light that we follow that, yeah. That's supposed to be, and you go, wow, that's that's a great example. If that has stepped down this far, it's not surprising. No, it's not. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. That. Thank you. That's very good. Well, you know, you can go look at a uh, church in Houston, one of the largest around, uh, Mr. Joel Osteen, uh, who it says that, best life now, and those kind of things. Those are promises for money and wealth and now, but they don't talk about Jesus the way. You can go back and listen to his, any number of sermons that you want. It sounds nice. It makes you feel good, but it doesn't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it doesn't say that the shedding of blood is necessary for the, the, um, for the um, uh, yeah, re remission of our sins. So without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, is what it says in Hebrews chapter 9. Um, so it's, it's, that's Jesus' death and resurrection. It's key, right? What is the gospel? That's what they taught. That's what they taught. It was all about Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All of us. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it is true. It, it's the, um, um, yeah, I, I, think, I think what Brian said certainly is right, though. The, the, the not wanting to offend anybody has actually changed and molded the uh, truth tellers. So I had uh, my brother-in-law and my sister, they're probably, they're watching online, perhaps live right now. But um, yeah, my brother-in-law had invited his brother and sister-in-law to class, so they were here a month ago or so, and uh, he just recently told me that his brother said, I can't believe that pastor lets him teach this way in here. They liked it, but they're like, we don't hear this, right? They were from Texas. So, um, 
they don't, I think, or no, Florida. They were from Florida. Um, that's a shame, isn't it? That people would come say, wow, that's truth, but that's dangerous territory, right? Thank God for Pastor Lynn, who allows us to do this class and do last day's alerts and talk about some of the current issues and what's going on in and around the country because it's easier to put on blinders and say, oh, no, all churches are good. Everybody's good. People who live their own lives, that's okay. You, you know, come all. True. We love come all. But ultimately, there's a day when the Lord's going to hit you with his word and he's going to say, straighten up, right? So that's what's going to happen, yeah. Yeah, isn't it though? Uh, okay, all right. So let me let's. Uh, no, this is fun. No, this is good. Okay, so Elaine said a very, very good point. As believers, it's our responsibility then to. Uh, some of you did that when we they were going through kind of a quickie revelation study, and they said something that you didn't believe and I didn't believe was actually biblically accurate. I, I thought that it was uh, moving into the uh, area of. Um, perhaps even amillennialism, it, 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 the way it was couched, perhaps, maybe not, hopefully not, um, but it, it's easier, right? It's easier to put everything in a big box and everybody can understand it if I just say that it's, um, that it's allegorical and not literal. Um, I usually find fault when I'm reading the word and I take it too, uh, if I if I don't take it literal enough, usually that's where my fault is. It's usually more literal than, than maybe perhaps I'm, I'm understanding, uh, which is, I think, true for probably for a lot of things. Some of the stuff that we're talking about, this coming back, you know, in the millennial reign, it's wild. I mean, it's wild teaching about, about how God is going to give all of Israel their spirit and the things that they're going to have to do to get there with the tribulation period and all these things. People, people don't want to hear that God is going to come with his wrath. He is. Seven years. He's promised it. Daniel 9, you know, all the way through Revelation, we see all this. this. Those are real things. They're hard, though. You tell a, a congregation full of people that are just coming to know the Lord that God is coming for those who do not believe, and they say, I don't know if I want to really follow that. I want... I want to know that all my, all my problems are going to be solved by the God that I serve. Well, they're not, that's not the way it works, right? We're in a sinful world. It won't be the way it works when Jesus is ruling reigning for a thousand years either because he is going to rule, it says, with a rod of iron. That is a strict rule, and there will be those that even though Satan's not there, they still have human nature that will not be following Jesus Christ. Hard to believe. But that's what will ultimately happen over that thousand years. Amazing. And so, and so this is this is the, yeah, this is this is what we are are battling. And I don't know, I don't know. It's hard if you hear a misstep from even a pastor, from anybody that you're listening to teaching, to say, hey, but it's important. It's important. I just had a discussion with one of my brother-in-laws uh, that was about something that was a difficult subject that the Bible really doesn't speak directly into. Now, it took quite a discussion. I mean, a heated discussion because I'm zealous. I'm like, no, it's not in the Word. It's not in the Word. It's not in the Word. Show me it. Show me it. Unable to be shown to me. But nevertheless, I could come around to an understanding only through a long process. But I want to do that. I want to hash it out. Let's get this out on the table and see if we can't come to, to either an agreement that the Bible doesn't say enough about it, because there's a few of those flyers out there. And so we can't, it's nice, your opinion, okay, makes sense. Why? Please back it up with scripture, and I'll back mine up with scripture, and then hopefully we can come to an agreement, or at least an understanding that, that it's possible and let it go. But some of those are really hard. Some of them can lead to people just saying, well, I can't believe in a God that has that ambiguous statement left in there, right? Baptizing for the dead. What does that mean? Guess what? When we do into baptism, there's a verse in there that talks about baptizing for the dead. What does that mean? When we get to baptism, three weeks from now, I'm going to tell you. So great. So we're going to find out. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think that means. So um, we're going to say, wow, how does this work? How does it, does it fit into what the Mormons do? Well, the answer is absolutely not, but I'll show you why. In, in the word. Uh, oh, right, right here. You had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say that the, the thrust of the study reminds me of how important it is for the uh, body of Christ to intercede for our leaders. 
Yes. It is, it is real, and that's why I mentioned the, the Naomi Wolf comment, that here's a woman who said, I see the spiritual battle. This is beyond regular, normal human battling because it's happening everywhere at the same time. I believe in God for the first time. It's cracked that door, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we do need to intercede. That's what you're saying, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you know where Satan's concentrating, don't you? It affects so many more people than just a regular private in the army, let's face it. Yeah. We just, and I'm sure we all believe that, but we need to be concentrated in our prayers for our pastors because they're special targets. Right. Because of the influence they bring yeah. in the body of Christ. Yeah. It absolutely is. I, it, it's like one of those things I say, I'm glad. I, I know I know pastors that have had to deal with with accusations. Uh, some of them we've seen, we've seen big churches fall, right, with, with pastors who have actually followed through with lusts or whatever it is that they get hit. And you know they're getting hit harder than anybody. One of the pastors, Al James, uh, up from uh, Prescott, Arizona, um, that uh, he has a ministry now called Pomium Ministries where they go around and kind of help churches where they've had fallen pastors or where they've mismanaged their funds and helps them get organized because he was, you know, longtime pastor. But um, one of the things that I know that he did, he did our marital counseling and he did it with the door open. And there was a reason why he did it in the door open. Anytime a woman was in that room with him, that door was open with the secretary. That, Sorry, I know it's counseling, but there needs to be accountability. And so he didn't want anything. You see what I'm saying? And, and that was from experience, I am sure, that you start to learn that, hey, if I'm going to counsel anybody, especially where it involves the opposite sex, I'm going to do it with the door open or I'm gonna have an assistant pastor come in with me or something. I need to protect this situation from accusation, from tearing down this church that the Lord hopefully is building up because it happens. And so it, it very, very interesting. The spiritual attack on a pastor, I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine the things that Lynn has to deal with every day. I said that early on. Just in this class, we're praying for a lot of people who've had illnesses as of late. And so can you imagine if you have 6,000 members that's a lot of people that are probably, if the percentage is near, anything near what we're having going on in this classroom, there, are, there is a physical and spiritual, I think, attack around, and uh, certainly we've seen that through the recent pandemic as well. So I know we spent a lot of time on the last day's alert, but it's a big deal because it directly affects the church, right? Not just you, but your friends that are going to other churches that might be hearing false doctrine. Can we hold them accountable, and can we pray for these pastors to come to know the truth if they are off? Because there's a lot of them that are trying to combine the world ways with biblical truths. And I'm telling you, it doesn't work that way. They, that you can, you can do it, and you can feel good about it. But it, it really, that's, that's, not, that's not what the Bible teaches. Can we get a little bit into Ezekiel then? Are we ready for that? Or do you have a few more things? No? Yeah, it's a worthy topic, without a doubt. So thank you for... for uh, digging in there. So we finished off at, at verse 14 of chapter 37 last week. And a couple things. All right. So where's your wife today? <laughs> Since she asked the question. <laughs> oh, Philadelphia. So she asked the questions and runs away. I get it. That, that's good. No, 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 no. That's good. So thank you, Mary, for bringing up the question. So because we were there, I would like to go back then and read... Uh, Let's read verse uh, 11 through 14 real quick, because verse 11 is where it came up. But it comes up more than once in Ezekiel, and we'll see that here uh, as I, I'll make mention to it. So, and the reason I didn't want to give, I'll give you the quick answer, which I could have given her right on that day, but it wasn't complete enough. And I knew that, and so that's why I said, let me either come around at the end of this stanza, which we didn't get around to, or let me address it the first thing today, and so that's what we're doing. So here's the question. The question is, it comes from, from verse uh, uh, 11, and it says, Then he said to me, Son of man, 
These bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Remember, we said last week that Israel's finally crying out. We recognize that we're cut off, that we're lost, that we're that. But it's the son of man question because Jesus called himself son of man. And so why is Jesus referred to as son of man and Ezekiel being addressed as son of man? How do we uh, come to grips with that? So uh, let's go... Let's go from that. So it goes on the rest of that. Uh, well, I'll pick up from there in a minute. Son of man, first off, is um, basically it means man, right? It means humanity. It means man. That's what son of man means. It's used um, 90 times to refer to Ezekiel. So the Lord comes to him and says, son of man, 90 times. That's a lot right? I mean, he rejects it. So we're definitely this human. I think the contrast for that is the difference between what his first view of the glory of God and you're the son of man. You're completely human and I am all that you see, right? And hear from my speaking. This is, <coughs> this is me compared to you. You are son of man. You are human. human. You are man, right? And I am God. There is a definite division between the two. So, um, so it definitely referenced uh, Ezekiel's humanity as in reference to God's uh, majesty, if you will. So in Jesus' case, Son of Man is used in the New Testament. So we've got 88 times it's used in reference to Jesus. So more times... Uh, or, or more times just in this one chapter about Ezekiel. But nevertheless, 88 times. And it highlights the humanity of Christ without a doubt, right? So we can say that. However, I think that there's something unique about this beyond just saying, yes, Jesus is 100% man and he's 100% God. So we can refer to him as son of man, capital S, if you will, because he is God and in his humanity, he's son of man. Uh, yes, that works. But the way the title is applied to Christ is interesting. First off, um, the, I'll say, son of man, I said the, which is true, in Jesus' case is, is associated with the definite article the. It's not just son of man. Every time in Ezekiel, it's son of man, not the son of man. It's son of man as in one of many for Ezekiel. It's the son of man as the one and only in the case of Jesus Christ. Interesting, the definite article, the, in front of son of man, that kind of changes it, right? There is only one, the son of man. There is our many humanity son of man, right? Not the. So it contrasts, I think there's a contrast there uh, with himself versus other personalities in the Bible that might be addressed as son of man. So we have, we have that. So he is always, uh, um, Ezekiel is never called the son of man. It's always just son of man. Okay, second and I think this is kind of more importantly, um, Jesus often refers to himself as son of man, that the son of man, I should say. He says, when the son of man, that's what he says. So you'll see that. And I think he is revealing to the Jewish people something more about himself. Why is he using the definite, right? The definite article, the, in front of that, he's saying uh, the son of man, or when the son of man returns, or son, the son of man, always the son of man. And I think what, to the Jewish people, it's a clue without coming right out and saying he's the Messiah. So he's not saying, hey, I'm the, I'm the Messiah. I am God. He didn't say that. He said, I am the Son of Man. They're comfortable with Son of Man because that's humanity. Ezekiel was called Son of Man. We're all okay with that. But for those who are really listening, they might be called, and this is what I love about the word, when I'm studying the word, some of the, the greatest or the most interesting things to me is when the Lord hits me and I go, hold it, there's another verse that uses that exact phrase. Let me go back and find that and see what that said. And I start to do that. I think the Jewish people, those who were learned in the, in the scripture, should have recognized the uh, uh, or son of man in a different aspect. And it comes from Daniel. So if we turn to Daniel chapter 7. So if you're in Ezekiel, because we're at Ezekiel, so you're going to go to the right uh, to Daniel and just go to chapter 7. We're just going to look at verse 13 and 14. So Daniel 7, 13 and 14 says this. So to me, him referring to himself as the son of man, as in the one and only, to me looks like this. After this, I saw in the night visions and behold, hold it. 
I'm in the wrong one, aren't I? Uh, yeah, verse 13. In night vision, yeah, and, be, and behold, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, no, I'm not at verse 13. Sorry, I was reading from the wrong one. Here we go. Verse 13. I was watching the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and I believe Ancient of Days is a term for God Almighty, God, right? And they brought him near before him. They brought the Son of Man, the Messiah, before God the Father. It says, and then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him, Jesus. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. So in this particular vision that Daniel has, he sees the son of man who is the coming Messiah. So when Jesus said, the son of man, referring to himself in the definite article, the son of man, as in the one and only, for those who had remembrance of the coming son of man, they would say, he's calling himself the Messiah. See, we always say, oh, Jesus didn't call himself God. Yes, he did. When he said, I am, he did. They picked up stones. And when he said, son of the son of man, he actually was calling himself God as well. He was saying, I am the Messiah. Isn't that awesome? To me, so that's more than, and that's why I said the simple answer is he's speaking to his humanity. Well, yeah, he is. But he's also, for those who are listening, giving them a clue about who is really before them. And I love that. I love that there's, there's more spiritual insight into him calling himself the son of man than, than before. So I, I, I think... I think that is, is true in that. And so to me, that kind of gives me a fuller understanding, hopefully you and when Mary hears it, that she will go, oh, okay, yeah, that, that's, that absolutely makes sense. So any, any other thoughts on that? I just thought that was interesting. So we had said that about, about the Son of Man. So when we see Son of Man referred to Ezekiel, we don't see the, there is no definite article before it, we just see Son of Man. So we're gonna get to get in a little bit deeper, just to finish, I pick it up from verse 12, even though we're only going to talk about verse 14 real quick. Uh, in verse 12, it says, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. We talked about that last week, so you can go back if you missed it and see that. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened the graves, O my people, and brought you from your graves graves so they will now recognize Jesus Christ once again last week now this is where we kind of left off I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land then you shall know that I the Lord have spoken it and performed it so now in verse uh, 14 we know we have this promise of the Holy Spirit to Israel it's coming to Israel right it's beyond the law it's the Holy Spirit. It's the law on their hearts, right? No longer will it be the law on tablets. It will be the law will be placed on their hearts, the Holy Spirit. That's our teacher. It's kind of the same for us, right? So we know for us, um, it's, it certainly will be different than the way we receive it because we do it on our belief in Jesus Christ now today in the age of grace. And we, as of from Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when he rained down the Spirit first on 3,000 Jewish people and then kept expounding, right, till all of us who now accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and believe that he died and rose again have that Holy Spirit imputed in us. We now have a teacher. It helps us to learn these words. And so that's super important as we know that how the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We do not have in here any clear revelation of what happens between the rapture of the church, right? It says when he is taken out away in Thessalonians, then he, the Antichrist, can be revealed. So when the Holy Spirit is taken up, and I believe that's when the rapture of the church, then and only then can the Antichrist be revealed. Now from that point on, when the church is gone, until Jesus' return, is second coming after the tribulation period, I don't know how the Holy Spirit works. I don't know if it's the same way that it works today. Is it like it worked in the Old Testament? But I do know when he comes, all those that enter in, all of the nation of Israel who has come to recognize him, who they pierced as their Messiah. In other words, it's still 
It's still dependent on their belief in Jesus Christ. The gathering of the sheep and the goat, or the separating of the sheep and the goats. He asked them, when you did this to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. He's talking about during the tribulation period, how did those treat the Jewish people? Well, certainly we have 144,000 marked people prophesying about who Jesus is, telling the, the word, certainly and dwelt with and marked by him, not to be touched during that time. We have others that by mid-tribulation will recognize this Antichrist uh, declaring himself to be God, and they're going to head to the hills, and they're going to be protected because it says Satan sends a flood after them, and God opens the earth and swallows the flood, and when Satan sees that he cannot touch those people that God is now going to protect in Jordan somewhere, I assume, is the wilderness, there. Uh, Petra, many people believe, but um, we know that God comes back through Basra, which is also in Jordan. But nevertheless, um, so then when those are, are protected, it says Satan will turn his attention on all the others that are believers, right? Anybody else who's believing in Jesus Christ, he's going after. So we have some Jewish people protected there. We have 144,000 protected, and then he goes after the rest of them. And we also know that it is an innumerable amount. We know this from Revelation with John looking down from heaven and asking the question, who are those that are underneath the altar crying out? When is it done? And, and, and the Lord says, when the number of you is completed, and it was an innumerable amount, many people will come to know the Lord and die for their faith, beheaded for their faith. And it says when they're done, and then we see they were given white robes and, and that goes on on from there. So we see we see what's going on during that trip, but I don't know how the Holy Spirit's working. I don't know if it works the same as us. I accept Jesus Christ. He lives and dwells in me and helps and teaches me. Or is it working where it comes and goes like the Old Testament? Like Old Testament, some prophets or kings, they had it and then they didn't have it. You know, uh, I don't know. I, I really don't know. We don't have any specifics, but we do know when he comes back here, everybody will be all of Israel will be indwelt with the Holy Spirit. It says he will give them, take away their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. So we have a lot of really interesting things going on during that time period. And I don't know what it looks like when we're gone between then and his second coming. So between the rapture and that, I'm not sure how the Holy Spirit's working. Could be any number of ways. And so we just don't know exactly, but we do know how it's going to work in the millennium. For sure. So just kind of an interesting point on that. Here's, here's what it says uh, exactly if you want. Just one verse earlier, because uh, if you're, sorry, I'm still in Daniel. Go back to Ezekiel, we're in uh, 37. But if you go back to 36, 26, and 27, right? Because we taught about this already. It says, uh, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you the heart of uh, give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then if you go forward to 39, we're not in 39 yet, but we will, and go to 39, 29, he says, and I will not hide my face from them anymore for I have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel. All who come from Israel who recognize Jesus Christ, all entering into that, that uh, millennial kingdom will have the spirit of God. It says, thus says the Lord God. So that's, that to me um, is, uh, is interesting. I just think that's, that's, uh, that's how God says he's going to do it. That's how he's going to do it. And so that's, that's all I have, right? And I, I just don't know how it's going to work in the middle but I know that I believe there will probably be a huge revival since it's an innumerable, innumerable amount that it will be beheaded for Christ that John sees um, from, from heaven. And so he's looking down at this and seeing that, and I'm thinking, wow, that's a lot of people. I wonder, uh, it, the, the sad thing is that what's left is a remnant at the end of that. And so it's pro maybe not a very big amount. Just think about the numbers of people that will die during the tribulation, first a quarter of them and a third of those, uh, a third of those remaining uh, will be taken out by various plagues and, and otherwise. So uh, that's, that's something, that's shocking. So what I have uh, then, oh, is probably I'm out of time. Am I? I am. Darn. Okay, so we basically got one verse done today, but... But we did get to talk about the Son of Man, so we're going to pick it up from 15 next week, or not next week, in, 
after three weeks. So uh, after the 4th of July, we'll be doing that. But please, please come. Don't forsake assembling yourselves together. Uh, Brian will be here. I hate for him to stand in front of an empty room uh, to, to have to, to go through those. But uh, it's, they're great subjects. They're deep subjects. I, I promise you there are people out there. We talked about the church and the lack thereof of some people adhering to biblical uh, uh, worldview. And in doing so, uh, some of that is because they get confused about certain things. Some of them throw away the whole faith, like we said, with a large number of pastors even walking away from the faith because it's just not consistent to them because they've mismatched it all up. And when you start to do that, then I think there's, there's problems. There can be holes and gaps in your faith. Guess where Satan likes to attack? In the thing you're not sure about, which is exactly what he did with Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said, did God really say? That's what he said. And so there, when you have and you think, well, the Bible contradicts itself here, right? So we say, it's not to me, here's a verse that says this and here says a verse that says that. Either the Bible's consistent or not consistent. How do we make that fit together? Because if you can't make it fit together, then you have a gap where Satan can hit you over the head and make you start to say, well, maybe if that's not true, then this isn't true. Why is it that he's gone after creation and introduced evolution into the society, into the world? It's, it's crumbling. We're going to crumble the beginnings. Maybe the whole thing will fall down, right? So same thing. Why is it that most pastors and teachers don't teach the book of Revelation? They're stay away from that. Same thing. We're going to just take out, we just take out the bookends on, on this Bible and rip those out and not talk about those because I really can't put it all together in my mind. It's no wonder pastors are losing, losing their faith. It's no wonder there's an apostia. There's a falling away of the faith among those that are in the church. Not only, that was a pastor's. You, can you imagine what the survey would be of the believers if they're not reading the word? probably worse than that these are people that went through seminary i mean they were taught to believe they were taught supposedly the deeper things of the lord that's what we're going to do the next three weeks we're doing predestination we're going to do salvation we're going to look and see whether or not what is it what's predestined were you chosen and you chosen for hell and you were chosen for heaven sorry at that table um <laughs> but <laughs> you know what is that is that how god does it that doesn't seem like a very just and fair and merciful god does it so let's look at that can you lose your salvation now that you believe what if you fall off the wagon if you will what if all of a sudden you you find yourself doing something you ought not did you lose your salvation is god going to pull pull that from you it says that ah, not anymore you were saved but not now that's the second thing we're going to look at and then baptism i said we're going to see that because a lot of churches teach if you're not baptized some of them if you're not baptized into this church you aren't saved and the, what is that what the bible teaches and then we're going to look at even in that the baptism of the dead what's a baptism for the dead what does that mean what does that look like? So we're going to touch on that at the end of that as well. So there's a lot of really good information that I think helps us with our faith, helps us be able to tell someone else who says, well, this says this. And you say, yeah, but look at the verses around it. And let's find out whether or not that, see, that's the problem with, with cherry picking verses. We can make a really uh, diabolical uh, scripture or religion when we start to cherry pick verses. I found out that the Book of War Mormon, not the Book of Mormon, but the Mormons teach the same scriptures every three years they alternate between um, um, the Book of Mormon, the Bible, I think the New Testament and the Old Testament. I think that's what it is and they rotate. But they use the exact same verses every time. Every third year, they don't change it up. It's the same ones. It's only the ones they cherry pick to prove their point. It's like, that's not studying the word. Yeah, I know you go to Sunday school. What did you do three years ago? Exact same thing. Same book? Yeah, use the exact same book, same scripture. This is what I know. This is what I do. Cherry picking verses to create a religion is wrong. It's not what we do. It's the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your truth and for your word. And help us to stay true to that. Let uh, that word drill down on my, my errors and my faults. Not to make me less than loved, but because I am loved, to try to form me into the kind of man and woman that you would desire us to be. Help these words then do that to us, that we have a better understanding of who you are, that you are indeed our God. You are omnipotent. You are omnipresent. You are all in all. And Lord, it is in that, in that uh, creative way that you made us, that you 
definitely want us to understand the way in which we should live. And so these words, this canon of scripture is closed. Nothing new. I can't add anything to it. I can't and shouldn't take anything away from it. But in it is enough for me to come to a better understanding of who you are, why you made me, what my purpose is, what your will is for my life, and, uh, and, and guide us and direct us. So help us to do that this week and the coming weeks as uh, we seek your truth and your word, for we know that it is that that provides freedom, not jail. It's not putting us in a box, and we dare not put you in a box, for you are greater than anything and all of our concerns and all of our mistakes. For you paid the price on the cross, and we thank you in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Have a uh, fantastic week. Uh, I will um, shift out to that. So uh, hopefully everybody online got everything. I hope it all worked. Mary wasn't in here to check it to make sure it did. So hopefully it did. God bless. Have a good week.